All right, welcome back to the Emerging Growth Conference. It's been a real successful day, and we've got one more presentation for you. We're very excited to present Hancock Jaffe Laboratories. It trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol HJLI and develops life-enhancing bioprosthetic devices and technologies intended to achieve unparalleled outcomes for patients with debilitating cardiovascular diseases. Please welcome the CEO, Robert Berman. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate you all hanging in there. Uh, it's always tough to be the last presentation, but I'm hoping that uh, in this case, anyway, that they've uh, saved the best for last. So um, some of you may not be familiar with the company, so I'm going to walk through uh, the slide deck, give you a little bit of a company background, and uh, talk to you about uh, mostly about our lead product, which is a product called the Vino Valve. Uh, Hancock Jaffe has been in existence for about 25 years. Uh, both uh, Warren Hancock and Norman Jaffe were prolific inventors back in the day. Warren Hancock uh, came out of Edwards Labs, as did uh, several um, uh, entrepreneurial engineering types. And so uh, if you were to Google, for example, Hancock and Heart Valve, you would see that Medtronic has been selling you know, the Hancock II bioprosthetic heart valve for many years, it's been a, a, a huge seller. And so the forte of the company has always been a tissue-based devices, either uh, bovine, uh, cow tissue, or porcine um, pig tissue. And um, keeping um, in line with that theme, uh, a lead product that we're going to talk to you about today is the Vino Valve, which is a, a porcine-based product. Um, we are a clinical stage company uh, with a long history of successful medical devices, uh, as I just mentioned, including the Hancock II uh, heart valve, which was um, invented by uh, one of our co-founders. Uh, we are on the cusp of a pivotal trial for our lead product, the Veno Valve. Uh, the Veno Valve treats a condition called chronic venous insufficiency which we think there are approximately 2.4 million people in the addressable market in the US. Uh, we've recently done a significant capital raise and currently have enough capital on hand um, to take us through um, results from our pivotal trial, which we call SAVE, S-A-V-V-E. We operate a 14,000 square foot facility here in Irvine, California, where we manufacture our own products. The company had been certified in the past to manufacture uh, products to FDA standards, and um, we anticipate uh, not having a problem with those certifications in the future. In talking about the Vino Valve, um, it's important to give uh, a little bit background, a little bit of a physiology uh, lesson. And so um, really, uh, people are under a misnomer thinking that the heart circulates the blood throughout the body. It really doesn't work that way when we talk about returning blood from the lower leg to the heart and lungs to get reoxygenated. The way that the blood gets back to the heart and lungs is actually your calf muscle serves as a pump. And your calf muscle pushes the blood up the veins of the leg. So that's why they tell you when you're sedentary, when you sit for a long time, perhaps on an airplane, that you should get up and walk. Because when you walk, you're flexing your calf muscle, and the calf muscle is pushing the blood up the veins of the leg. In the veins of the leg are a series of one-way valves. Uh, I like to think of them as rungs on a ladder. So picture that you have a little ladder inside the veins of your leg. And in a healthy person, the way those valves are supposed to operate is the calf muscle pushes the blood up, the blood gets to a valve, the valve opens, and then the blood goes through, and then the valve closes. And there are several valves in the venous system. Uh, and in the deep vein system, which is what we're focused on here today, the blood would therefore go from valve to valve to valve against gravity and work its way back to the heart and lungs to get reoxygenated. That's the way it works in a healthy person. Uh, unfortunately, in a rather large cohort of people, 
patients, mostly patients that have suffered blood clots, which they may or may not know about, those valves in the veins of the leg do not operate properly. And they either leak or um, they don't close. And just like when you're climbing the rungs on a ladder, if a rung were to break, gravity takes over and you fall to the ground, the same thing happens to the blood in the veins of your leg if the valves aren't working properly. So the calf muscle pushes the blood up, but if the valve doesn't open and close properly and doesn't hold, the blood drops down and flows in the opposite direction. We call that blood flowing in the opposite direction reflux. And what happens is because of gravity and because of reflux, the blood starts to pool in the lower leg. When that happens, the pressure inside of the veins increases dramatically. We call that pressure venous hypertension. And that's when the patient will start to get pain that is significant enough to wake them out of a sleep. Uh, they'll get discoloration on their leg. The leg will blow up three to four times the size of a normal leg. And in severe cases, the person, uh, the patient, uh, gets venous ulcers. These are open sores that usually occur in the ankle area of the lower leg uh, that are very, very difficult to uh, get to heal properly. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there's approximately 2.4 million people in the U.S. that have the type of severe CVI uh, that I was referring to in the deep vein system that suffer from significant reflux. What we know about those patients is that on average, they spend $30,000 a year on wound care, trying to get those venous ulcers healed. We know that after a year, 25% are still not healed. And those that do heal, they have a very high recurrence rate. So it's a 20 to 40% recurrence rate uh, in the first year and up to a 60% recurrence rate at five years. And the reason for that is getting the wound to heal, just treating the wound doesn't take care of the underlying problem, which is the reflux and the venous hypertension. And so unless you take care of that problem, uh, the venous ulcers are going to recur. And so understand that this is a very serious disease. This is a very debilitating for the patient. The patient can't bathe. The patient can't, in many cases, get around and, and, and perform normal household tasks. And so these patients are miserable. The quality of life of these patients is very, very poor. Currently, for deep CVI sufferers, patients that are suffering from CVI in the deep vein system, the current standard of care, and by the way, if you look at your screen, that's what a venous ulcer looks like. So as I said, we're not talking about a nuisance disease here. We're talking about something that's significant. And right now for these patients with this type of significant venous ulcer and reflux of the deep vein system, the current standard of care is compression garments and literally go home and put your legs up so that the blood runs out of the veins of your leg. For compression garments to work, they would have to be so tight because they actually would need to squeeze the blood up the veins of the leg against gravity. So that would make them in increasingly uncomfortable and very difficult for the patient to get on and off, which is why compliance with compression garments is very, very low. So again, the current standard of care for patients with deep venous CVI is compression garments and leg elevation. That's it. Well, at Hancock Jaffe, uh, we're looking to change that standard of care. And we've developed a valve uh, this is a porcine-based product, as I mentioned previously, that gets implanted in the upper thigh region via a five to six inch incision that we think will decrease that backwards flow of blood, that reflux that we talked about, and will therefore also decrease the pressure inside the veins and provide relief to the patients. 
And so we've created both a valve and a procedure for putting in that valve. And I will um, show you uh, the short uh, minute long video, which will explain to you how the valve operates and the procedure to put in the valve. The veno valve procedure begins with a 6 to 8 inch incision being made in the upper thigh to access the femoral vein. Clamps are used to restrict the flow of blood through the vein. The surgeon then makes a 2 to 3 centimeter lengthwise incision called a venotomy along that portion of the vein. The veno valve is then inserted into the vein through the incision. Next, the stabilization ring of the inflow veno valve frame is tacked to the femoral vein wall and the incision in the vein is closed. Once the clamps are removed, blood flow is restored to the vein. The veno valve opens and closes based upon the flow rates and blood pressures within the femoral vein. When the calf muscle flexes, pressure within the femoral vein increases and blood flows up the leg and through the veno valve. When pressure in the femoral vein decreases, the veno valve leaflet deploys closing the valve and reducing the backwards flow of blood called reflux. So that is our implantation procedure, and that's how the valve operates, and I'm happy to take uh, questions on that, uh, you know, following the presentation during the question and answer session. Now, what we determined when we created the veno valve after doing some experimentation in animals is that there really is no good animal model for the veno valve. Because if you think about it, there's no animal that walks upright on two legs that has the same calf muscle function and venous flows and pressures as a human. And so we met with the FDA and after consultation with the FDA, decided to do a small first in human trial prior to the US pivotal trial. That trial took place in Bogota, Colombia, and we set that trial up to be, in essence, a dress rehearsal for the pivotal trial. So instead of just having anecdotal data like some people do in their first in human trials, we actually had uh, study endpoints, which as you'll see in a few minutes, are, are the same endpoints that we're using for our pivotal trial. So of course, safety is always a primary concern of the FDA. Uh, reflux, that backwards flow of blood that I alluded to several times earlier, that can be measured via a duplex scan. Something called a VCSS or venous clinical severity score, that's a grading system that the clinician uses to grade uh, the disease that we're talking about, chronic venous insufficiency. And that's a score that's been used in prior clinical FDA studies. And then finally, a visual analog score, which is a pain score. And so we implanted 11 patients in Bogota with the vena valve. They were implanted over the course of the year. And last December, we released our first in human data on uh, the vena valve study in Bogota. And what that data showed us, first of all, we didn't have any um, device-related safety issues. The only safety issues that we had were relatively minor, and they were either with respect to the wound itself not healing properly or patients not complying with their anticoagulation medication. And we've taken steps in the pivotal trial or are taking steps in the pivotal trial to ensure that those same issues don't happen. But those issues were very minor and were not device-related. If you look at the data from the first in human trial, what it showed was that, and this shows all 11 patients, and this shows um, both the pre-surgery uh, level of reflux and then the level of reflux at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 180, and 365. And if you look across our patient cohort, what you see is that immediately after venovalve surgery, reflux uh, started to reduce and continued to reduce uh, pretty much through about six months and then stayed relatively constant throughout the year. Uh, on average, reflux was reduced 54% across all patients. Now, the one exception is patient number six. You can see uh, she was doing extremely well at 90 days, 
she had a venous ulcer that was beginning to heal beautifully. And so she was feeling so good, she decided to stop taking her anticoagulation medication on her own. And that resulted in a thrombosis, a clot into the valve. So the valve stopped working. So that's what happened with patient six. But the 54% includes patient six, in case you're wondering. If you look at our next study endpoint, the VCSS score, you'll see that here again, about 90 days after the surgery, the disease manifestations started to disappear. And so uh, over the course of the year period, uh, the average uh, reduction in disease manifestations was 56%. And what that means is that the patients went from having very severe CVI to either a much more mild form of CVI or uh, no evidence of the disease at all. And if you look at our third endpoint, pain, you'll see that once the patient recovered from the pain from the surgery itself, which generally takes about uh, 30 to 60 days, uh, pain scores reduced dramatically to the point where if you look at patients 9, 10, and 11, they went from having very high pain scores pre-surgery to having uh, no pain at one year post-surgery. So uh, looking at all of our endpoints on the same graph uh, shows us that reflux improved 54%. Um, VCSS scores improved an average of 56%, and pain improved 76%. Now, those numbers are certainly very encouraging, but you may say to yourself, how do we know that 56% or 54% is enough? Did we make a difference in the lives of the patients? And so we have a, a short testimonial video uh, that is in Spanish, but is subtitled. And uh, these are five of the patients that we did in Colombia, uh, unscripted. And so I will play that video uh, for you now. Mi nombre es William Romero. Yo soy Luz María Vargas Aguilar. Mi nombre es Miguel Antonio Rodríguez. Mi nombre es Carlos Quiñones. Bueno, mi nombre es Blanca Cecilia Betancur Ortiz. ¿Más activo? Sí, por supuesto. Por supuesto, he estado más activa, más, más dinámica. Sí, claro. Quiero jugar fútbol. Si tuviera que escribir en una sola frase, Beno Valve, ¿cuál sería? Una sola frase es volver a hacer ejercicio, volver a vivir. Volví a renacer. Recuperar el sueño, recuperar el movimiento pues la verdad es de una gran renovación. Para mí ha sido bueno, excelentemente. Ha sido muy bien, muy bien atendida, no tengo que en ninguno de, en ninguno de ellos. So, um, I have to tell you, it's very gratifying to be the CEO of a company and come out with a device that's making that much of a difference in patients' lives. To hear a patient say, I was reborn again, um, uh, you know, I, I want to go play soccer. I mean, these people were almost completely incapacitated due to CVI and following the veno valve um, are, are really coming back to life and living life again. And that that's that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, to give you an idea, these are some of the venous ulcers on the patients pre-surgery, and this is some of the significant ulcer healing that we saw as a result of the veno valve. So it's really quite remarkable. So as a result of the uh, first in human trial, um, we met with the FDA in the beginning of January for what's called a pre-IDE meeting. In order to conduct a pivotal trial in the United States, uh, you need what's called an investigational device exemption, or IDE. And so we had a pre-IDE meeting with the uh, FDA uh, beginning of January. In March, we filed our IDE application. And 28 days later, we received IDE approval from the FDA to um, approve our U.S. pivotal trial. That trial is called 
the SAVE trial, S-A-V-V-E. It will consist of uh, 75 patients across 20 sites uh, in the U.S. Um, we have some of the top uh, vascular surgeons uh, and va vascular practices in the country that have agreed to be a part of the trial. The endpoints for that study uh, will be uh, very similar to our first in humans trial. We'll be looking at reflux, again, measured by a Doppler, VCSS scores, VAS scores, and uh, QOL scores. So I mentioned earlier that we set up the first in human trial to be a dress rehearsal um, for the pivotal trial. And so the endpoints will be almost the same. Uh, I mentioned we had a couple of areas of uh, difficulty in the first in human trial, particularly patient compliance with taking anticoagulation medication. Uh, we will be using um, a uh, different type of anticoagulation medication called a DOAC in our pivotal trial where the patient won't need to get their blood tested as often. And we'll also be implementing an app where we will be able to monitor whether patients are taking their medications as instructed. So um, um, those are, are measures that we've put in place to address the few difficulties that we had in the first in human trial. I mentioned earlier that there's approximately 2.4 million people in the US that suffer from a severe deep venous a CVI that would be candidates uh, for the veno valve. Instead of uh, taking my word for it, uh, I've done a bit of an analysis as an analyst would do, uh, what they call both a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach in looking at the addressable market. And so for the bottom-up approach, uh, there was a search done of the Medicare database and 60 large insurance companies, uh, I believe this was done in 2014, and what they found was that a uh, venous ulcer incidence was 2.2% in the Medicare database and about 0.5% in the uh, private insurance database. So uh, using those incidences with today's population numbers, that would mean that there's about 1.97 million people in the US that are diagnosed with venous ulcers each year. And those are people over the age of 65. Um, so um, when you look at that combined with the um, C5 patients, so, so there's basically two categories of patients that are candidates for the venal valve. C5 patients are those patients that have had a venous ulcer with, within the past year. And C6 patients are patients with an active venous ulcer. And so if you look at those incidences from the Medicare claims and private insurance claims and apply them to today's population, you come up with approximately 2.8 million patients in the US. That's the bottom-up approach. The top-down approach, there was a screening program done by the National Venus, it's called the National Venus Screening Program. And in that program, uh, they took uh, members of the general population and then graded them as uh, for degrees of venous disease. And what that showed us was that uh, basically about 100 million people in this country have some form of chronic venous disease, 100 million people. That's, that's enormous. Um, but again, we're focused on patients with C5 and C6 disease and reflux of the um, deep vein system. So uh, what that study showed was about 4.2 million patients in the U.S. had C5 and C6 disease, and that of those patients, 31% uh, had reflux in the deep femoral vein and 17% had reflux in the popliteal vein. So from a top-down approach, you come to about 2 million patients. And if you average those two together, that's how we got the 2.4 million patients. Uh, these numbers are cited at the bottom of the slide, and you can see the article uh, articles uh, that have this information. Now, when we talk about 2.4 million patients, let's put that in perspective. What does that really mean? Is that a large market? Is that a small market? Well, let's look at um, medical devices that are commonly implanted in the United States. When we look at those devices, we see that approximately 
790,000 knee replacements are done a year in the U.S., about 450,000 hip replacements, 200,000 pacemakers, 180,000 heart valves, and 24,000 abdominal aortic aneurysms. So the, these are some of the most implanted devices in the U.S. and the numbers of procedures that are done in, in a given year. For the veno valve, with a potential addressable market of 2.4 million, that's very, very large. And if you look at how many companies are chasing the number of procedures done for each of those devices that we mentioned earlier, right? There's 50 companies that basically manufacture knee replacements, 50 companies for hip replacements. Uh, there's 20 or 10 companies are chasing 24,000 procedures, uh, AAA procedures. When you consider the fact that we are the only or will be the only ones in the veno valve or venous valve space with 2.4 million addressable market, um, that really gives you an idea of the magnitude of the opportunity that we have here at Hancock Jaffe with the veno valve compared to other markets in the US. So one might ask, okay, this is a really large market. How are you going to reach that market? How are you going to commercialize, uh, assuming that you uh, do receive FDA approval? And so we envision uh, a phased rollout approach um, that consists of basically three phases. The first phase will focus on uh, vascular surgeons and their current uh, patient base. These are vascular surgeons that do arterial work and have an interest in venous disease. So overall, there are about 3,000 vascular surgeons in the United States. We're focused on a subset of that group, and um, that's the group that we will focus on for, let's say, phase one of the rollout. In phase two of the rollout, we will be focusing on referring doctors. So where are these people currently being treated, particularly people with venous ulcers? Well, a lot of those people see their general practitioner. They might be at wound centers. They might be at vein centers, phlebologists, dermatologists, or people that present with DVT PE indications. We know from the literature that um, about two thirds of people that present with DVT PEs um, have um, reflux. And so that's where these patients are. And so our, our second phase of rollout will involve contacting the referring physicians and having them push the business to our, let's call them phase one vascular surgeons. And then finally, our third phase of the rollout is we foresee as uh, contacting the patients directly. So an awareness campaign um, focused on patients that you know have these disorders but might not know that there are remedies available. And so what we envision is having these this sort of wheel that we've created here, um, certainly 20 of these throughout the US, uh, which are will be the 20 sites that are participating in our pivotal trial, but ultimately um, having as many as, let's say, 40 sites uh, available to patients maybe in the first year and then successive rollouts after that. So that's the phased in approach that we anticipate using uh, in order to uh, reach the patient populations. Now, when we talk about a medical device, there are uh, basically uh, four groups of stakeholders that need to be, um, that the device needs to appeal to in order for a device to be successful. And so let's walk through those uh, briefly and, I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll address each one. From the company perspective, being the only company in the space will have strong pricing power. We anticipate having margins that are at or above uh, general uh, pricing margins in the space. So we think north of 80% and accelerated growth. When moving now to the right-hand side, um, for doctors, it's very difficult to persuade a doctor to stop using a treatment that they've been using for the past several years, stop using a device, and to use our device. 
Well, we won't have that problem with the veno valve because there are no existing treatments that these doctors are using. So number one, we don't have a difficult time convincing doctors to stop doing something that they're already doing. Number two, as you saw the procedure uh, in the animated video we played earlier, uh, it, it's, it's not necessarily a simple surgery, but it's certainly, I would say, an easy surgery. So we anticipate a short learning curve. And then number three, doctors are currently not making money from these patients. And so we see the veno valve as adding incremental revenue for the doctor. Moving on to the hospital, advantages of the veno valve, there's no significant capital investment. There's no machinery and equipment that a hospital has to invent, invest in to adopt the veno valve. Uh, we foresee this as being a profitable procedure. And then finally, wound care that I alluded to earlier, that's currently a losing economic proposition for hospitals. So not only would they be making money on the veno valve procedure, but we would be curtailing the losses that they currently um, have on wound care. And then finally, if we look at the reimbursement community, as mentioned earlier, the average person spends $30,000 a year on wound care. After a year, 25% of venous ulcers are still not healed. Uh, there's a very high recurrence rate. And as I also mentioned earlier, uh, we have several of the KOLs and, uh, involved in our pivotal trial. So we think we'll have the support that we need to make a very strong argument to the reimbursement community. Next milestones coming up for the veno valve. As mentioned earlier, we did receive ID approval in Q2. Uh, we're currently uh, going out to our sites for what's called IRB, Investigational Review Board approval, and to get uh, agreements in place with all our sites. We're also uh, going through the qualification and training process with each of our sites. We expect first patient in the SAVE trial in Q3 of this year and expect uh, an enrollment update by Q4, at which at the end of Q4, at which point we hope to have a substantial number of patients um, enrolled in the trial. We'll have interim data that will be released throughout 2022. And then we anticipate being PMA eligible. And PMA approval is what you need to actually market your product to the general public. We anticipate being PMA eligible uh, in Q1 of 2023. Moving on to our board of directors and executive leadership, uh, frankly, we have a world-class board of directors. Uh, Francis Duhay, the former chief medical officer at Edwards Life Sciences, uh, Dr. Sanjay Srivastava is in-house at, uh, John, at uh, Johnson & Johnson in business development, Matthew Genusitis, a former president of uh, Boston Scientific Peripheral Division, and Bob Gray, former chief financial officer at Highmark. Highmark is a very large uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield insurance company. So um, we have a very distinguished uh, board of directors. And moving on to our management team, a very experienced management team, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Mark Glickman, our chief medical officer, who's been a practicing vascular surgeon for 40 years, and Dr. Hamid Alavi, our VP of Research and Development, who comes to us uh, from Edwards and Medtronic. So you're talking about a, a, a skilled management team that uh, has, has taken products uh, through R&D stage and into commercialization. What does that mean? Why should you care about that? Well, what that means is that we execute. And if you look at what we've accomplished uh, over the past couple of years, and particularly in the past year, and you look at where we were, let's say, at the beginning of COVID and where we are as a company now, it's really remarkable. Um, we completed our first in, in human trial, as we spoke about, with no material COVID delays. Uh, every patient made every appointment, and it took some outside-the-box thinking of our management team in order to get them into those appointments. Uh, we received IDE approval for a pivotal trial in 28 days, which is almost unheard of. Uh, you know, we've raised $65 million over the past few years to fund the company. And as I mentioned, we're currently funded uh, through the results in the pivotal trial. Uh, we've recruited top of the 20 of the top um, vascular practices in the country uh, to be a part of our pivotal trial. And we have 11 new employees that have joined the company 
since January of 2020. So we're growing and we are executing, and we hope to continue to do that um, in, in the coming months. Looking at our, our finances and capitalization, um, at the end of March 2020, we had $43 million on hand, and you'll see uh, 8.5. A common shares outstanding, and you can also see the warrants and the options and the fully diluted. Finally, uh, I have a couple of supplementary slides. Uh, people often ask me for comps and what companies we would consider to be, you know, uh, 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 comparable companies. And of course, being a first mover, as we are with the Vino Valve, and hopefully after approval, uh, leading. Uh, a paradigm shift. There's no company that has a, a Venus valve similar to ours. So we will definitely be the first mover in that space. However, um, three companies that I like to focus on and I like to study that were early movers in their space in the peripheral vascular space are uh, Anari Medical, uh, Shockwave, and Silk Road. And, you know, I think we are where they were, or we're about a year, year and a half, two years away of, uh, of um, hopefully attaining the significance that those companies have attained, both in terms of um, uh, development and market cap. So if, if you want to understand what the potential of Hancock Jaffe is, uh, I'd look at each of those companies. Um, when I go through those companies and go through the list of factors such as margins, uh, addressable market, uh, ASP, all of the, the key indicators, uh, I think that we are in, in very, very good shape and that we um, compare uh, quite favorably. We do have a, a second product that's called the Choreographed. That's an off-the-shelf graph that's used for uh, cabbage surgeries. Uh, that product is undergoing a first-in-human trial in Paraguay. That trial has been put on hold due to a re, uh, resurgence of COVID in South America. And so uh, we don't have any other information on that at this point, but I did want to mention the choreographed in passing. With that being said, um, uh, that is our presentation, and I'm happy to open it up uh, to questions from our audience. Thank you, Robert. Yes, we do have a few questions for the last few minutes of our conference. Um, when do you expect that Hancock Jaffe would become an acquisition candidate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would anticipate that when we start to have um, uh, pivotal trial data, that the um, you know that we could start to see inquiries with respect to acquisitions. However, um, you know there are quite a few acquisitions that get done in the medical device space. Let's say in the hundred fifty to two hundred million dollar range, we don't look at the Vino Valve as that type of opportunity. We look at it as an opportunity north of five hundred million dollars, and it, looking for that type of money generally means that you have to start to commercialize the product on your own. And so in order to get for us to get the value and the value for our shareholders that we think is uh, appropriate for the Vino Valve, it is likely that we will, again, begin commercialization on our own. Uh, the idea here isn't to get a fast acquisition done. It's to get an acquisition done if, in fact, it occurs. Um, with appropriate value for our shareholders. So we can't count on an acquisition. Uh, if it happens at the appropriate value, that would be great. But we're preparing to commercialize this product and do everything necessary to bring this product to market on our own. That's what the shareholders should expect. And if, in fact, an acquisition happens along the way, and it's, again, at the appropriate value, we would certainly consider it. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any idea when the choreograph study will resume? I don't at this point. Um, there's been a, a big resurgence in COVID in South America, Paraguay borders Brazil. I think if you watch the news, you'll see that uh, COVID is just rampant over there. And so um, we don't have any further information on that. Uh, it will take, you know, COVID being under control in those areas, and I'm really not sure how quickly that's going to happen. Okay. 
Um, uh, concerning the valve, is there any maintenance required after the valve is implanted? No. Uh, other than the patient perhaps being on an anticoagulation medication um, for an extended period and perhaps for the rest of their lives, uh, there is no maintenance that's required on the valve itself. Okay, thank you. That answered another question of ours. Um, what would the score be if you removed the data from patient six? Yeah, so uh, the reflux improvement would be, frankly, significantly higher. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to include all patients, including the patient that thrombosed. I don't have the um, a number in front of me, but uh, it would be it would be even better than the numbers that we presented. For our pivotal trial, the SAVE trial, our primary endpoint is reflux at six months and a 30% improvement in reflux. 30% is the lowest improvement in reflux that we saw in the first in human trial. And those patients that did have a 30% improvement in reflux showed marked improvement in CVI symptoms. So that's where the bar has been set in terms of our pivotal trial and our primary effectiveness endpoint. Okay. Um, what, how much was invested to develop the Vino valve? And what percentage of this debilitating market do you think you can actually acquire? Yeah, so I can only speak to when I came to the company uh, three years ago, we raised approximately $65 million. Um, you know, the Vino valve rollout, uh, how much of the 2.4 million people do we think we can acquire? Um, certainly enough to drive a significant value uh, for our shareholders. And what I mean by that is if you look at the three companies that I alluded to earlier, you know, they are valued based at some multiple of sales. And, you know, we think at this point that the ASP uh, for the Vino valve will be in the fifteen dollars to $20,000 range. And so if you look at the, um, take, you know, $15,000, for example, and take, uh, you know, uh, do a little pro forma and figure out, um, you know, if, if we charge $15,000 and we do, let's say, 1,000 procedures or 1,400 procedures in one year, um, you know, what would our revenue be? And then you look at the multiple that's applied to uh, each of those companies that I mentioned earlier, that'll give you some idea of uh, the elasticity and how many procedures we would need in order to reach what our goal is, which is to, you know, to have a, a, a market cap of, of a billion dollars or more. We have a, quite a few more questions. We're going to email them to you. Last question. Will there be more offerings in 2021? Uh, not likely. Uh, you know, we raised plenty of money and uh, have enough money to take us through to the end of the trial. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't be opportunistic uh, mm -hmm. if uh, some type of a strategic or a significant fund came along and wanted to make an investment in the company. So um, I wouldn't completely close the door, but I would answer that as, as not likely. Okay. Well, we'll send the rest of these questions to you, Robert. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. We look forward to your updates. Great. Thank you all for attending, uh, hanging in there with me, and hopefully I made it worth your while. Thank you all. You sure did. All right, everyone. Well, on behalf of all of us at Emerging Growth, I'd like to thank all of our presenters and all the attendees for helping make this Emerging Growth Conference such a great success. Remember that a complete replay of this conference separated by company will be available on the Emerging Growth Conference YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Emerging Growth Conference. Make sure you subscribe. Also, follow us on Twitter at Emerging Growth C. We always post new information on Twitter first. I'm Anna Berry, and I'm grateful to be here. And everyone who made this event possible today, I wish you all a really great rest of your day, a successful week, and we look forward to seeing you at our next conference. Thanks all for watching.